words there. Okay. So um, this is Sean Mullery from Electronic Engineering at IT Sligo and um, what I'm going to be doing tonight in multi-view geometry and computer vision is I'm going to be looking at the two-view reconstruction. Now um, in the previous lecture, this is kind of the second half of the two-view reconstruction. Uh, the first half we were looking at the epipolar um, constraint and we determined an essential matrix from that that allowed us to get the rotation and translation of the the camera between the two views okay and even if it was two different cameras that didn't matter it, it could at least tell us the uh, rotation and translation that it would have had to undergo in order to get from one view to the other so we have that piece of information and if you recall from last week one of the problems with trying to do any of these reconstructions is that um we have a kind of a catch-22 or a chicken and egg problem where um we we don't know the 3d points uh, we don't know their coordinates or their 3D coordinates and we don't know the rotation and translation and we had to kind of separate those out so that we could try and get rid of one part of them and what we did was we got rid of the 3D coordinates out of the equations leaving us only with the rotation and translation uh, uh, all balled up admittedly into this essential matrix and from that we were able to see uh, a relationship between the uh, the points that uh, the corresponding points that appeared in two images. So that's normally our starting point. We have some points in images and we have a correspondence between them. So we're able to tell between them. Um, and when we put, put a, a number of these together as part of the A point algorithm, we were able to determine the rotation and translation. And now this is where our starting point is tonight. We want to be able to figure out from uh, knowing that now, how do we fi find out something about the 3D geometry? How do we get our 3D points? Uh, now, there will be other parts to the lecture tonight as well. Uh, I'll be looking at some degenerate uh, cases. And I will also be looking at the situation of what occurs when you don't know the camera intrinsic um, matrix or the camera intrinsic parameters, uh, which is the camera matrix. Um, if we don't know that information, how do we find it out? So we'll come to that later. So for now, um, last week we determined E, which is the essential matrix, and we can get from that R and T, uh, we can get R the rotation and T the translation up to a scale factor. Okay, so we, we, we can never know that for definite, but if we know it maybe from some other piece of information, then from that we can determine everything else from that scale. Okay, but there will always be that ambiguity there. Um, that's not really something we can, we can solve very easily uh, just by our own camera methods. So what do we do next? How do we reconstruct the 3D points? So firstly, we must take the scale factor into account. So we do this by basically using this uh, gamma variable. And just be wary that, that, that we've written that as, a, um, as gamma rather than lambda. So don't mix the two of them up. Uh, they're different things. So this is um, something to do with the scale of that translation. So when we put that here, what we're uh, it, beside the T, what we're basically saying is that the T is, is only representing the direction of the translation and uh, exactly what the size of it is, is going to be represented by this gamma variable so that we can then use that elsewhere to determine uh, everything else and the scale of everything else from that. So we have here then the, the relationship between our two-dimensional coordinates um, and the rotation and translation, how that gets, how that gets there. So... Um, we've written our two-dimensional coordinates uh, as if they were 3D. In other words, we've shown the two unknown parts, which are, are the, um, the distance that our two-dimensional coordinates are from the point. So if you remember, draw kind of a, a thing like that, some point in 3D space, and we've got a point there, um, which we call large X. And we want to be able to view that from our two camera views. So I'll just um, take a camera view here, and I'm looking at it there like that. And I take some second camera view here and I'm looking at it there like that. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to draw it better than that. Okay. So um, what we have here is we have um, our, just actually get rid of that one. Um, we have our distance there to that one. Um, that would be our uh, lambda, lambda one. And then our, our distance to there would be our lambda two. And the thing is, we don't know those. Um, we know the rotation and translation that has gone on here. We figured that out. So we've got our R and our T, um, but we, we don't know uh, th those pieces of information. We don't know the length of those. Um, and therefore, that's what we now want to figure out. And we've, we've got a, quite a lot of information now, so we should be able to figure that out from here. Um, so the unknown scale parameters um, are the uh, lambda, 
which we'll call the lambda j's in other words for each for each different uh set of pixels we've we've got um some some lambdas there that we, we can figure out and remember we could you know fr from our previous algorithm we had eight sets of points so that means that we've we've got eight of these that we could work with um that means uh, that in other words our, our j value could go from zero up to eight or, z or one up to eight um but of course we can use more points than that again so we can have lots of these points and try and figure out our 3d reconstruction from there and try and find out um wh what they all are so we've seen previously how we can get rid of one of these one of these unknowns by multiplying across by um the x2 with this here so if you remember that that was that skew symmetric matrix so what we're basically saying is that this is the cross product with um with x i think i think i've written as big x there and it should be a small x so um that's what i've done i've multiplied on this side by the cross product there and as you can see there that is going to turn all of that there into a zero okay now i've also multiplied it on this side here as well so we've got it there and it has to go in there as well beside the um beside the translation as well now what's the effect of it going to be zero here well that's going to zero out the whole of that side so what we basically have then is we have that all just taken out okay uh, so we're just going to have a zero on that side of the brackets but everything else then on the other side that's that's fine that stays there and we're going to use that uh, we now have something equal to zero which you've seen before um uh, so so we, we can kind of work with that. So this gives us the, the following. It gives us the um, lambda j1 by the, this skew symmetric matrix, um, which is the cross product with x2, the rotation, and then the um, two-dimensional coordinate um, xj1. And then you add to that the scale factor. That's our scale factor there, which is gamma. Um, again, that skew symmetric matrix uh, with, with X2 and our translation, which, as I said, is, is really just telling us the direction at this stage that we're going in. And uh, we've split it up into a scale factor and a, and a direction. And this equals to zero. Now, once you see any of these things where we get back equal to zero, we're back to that whole idea of trying to find um, a null space. And that's what we're going to do. When we get enough of these points together, we're going to try and define it by... Um, uh, you know, finding the one part of this that's going to, the one vector that's going to um, be projected to zero that isn't the zero vector itself, um, and that will, will try and solve our problem. So you can see that this turns up again and again and again, and this is possibly much more important than any of the individual things that you learn in this subject. It's to learn that there are certain mathematical constructs that we have that are going to show up again and again and again, and if you get an idea of those, and you get those into your head, then each new idea that comes along you'll suddenly find that it's not as new as it originally appeared to be. It's actually using all of the different things that you're you become now familiar with. So at first, every new thing that you come across seems really, really difficult, but you find after a while that it's actually using all of the same tools uh, and, and it then becomes a little bit easier to understand. Um, so I know that when you, when you first see a lot of this stuff, it, every little bit of it seems new, but it's actually not. So what we can do is we can split this up into a linear system and uh we can uh take off our our lambda lambda j's here and you can see what's going to happen here um this um this side here is going to be multiplied by that and then this here is going to be multiplied by that and the two are going to get added together and we end up with with this here so this is just a different way of writing it we write it as if it was a um uh, as if it was a linear system um that we can do with vectors so that's great and but the, the thing is that we don't have enough information there to solve this in one go uh, because we only have one set of corresponding points there and we're going to need a good bit more in order to solve it uh, or to be sure of it so we can make the whole a whole vector out of this so as many points as you have as many points in j that you have um you can put those all in one big long line here okay one big long line and you have this one down the bottom, which is the scale factor. And that's very much this uh, homogeneous coordinates idea again. That what we're saying is that whatever we pick, and we can arbitrarily pick some scale factor, let's say we, we pick it as 5 just for the sake of argument, it's 5, then what's going to happen is that, that that means that each one of these, uh, each one of these guys here is going to be 5 times as big as it would be if we picked this as being a value of 1. So at the end, when it comes to solving this, we're going to divide down by that scale factor, just the same as we did with all our homogeneous coordinates.
Okay, so that's how we deal with that uh, that scale factor. So we make one big long vector out of that, and we call that uh, lambda with a little arrow on the top to suggest that it's a vector there. Okay, and it's got all, all of those those uh, those vectors, and you can see that. What we're trying to find here, uh, if you remember back here when we were um, when we were looking at this, and I said we had we had lambda one, okay. We also had a lambda two, but we lost that lambda two when we did this. So what we're going to try and find out now in this case is we're going to try and find out that lambda lambda one, and we're going to try and find out that lambda one for each of the different positions, okay. So for each of the different uh, points that we might have, and the idea here is that. Um, those won't all be the same values or anything like that. It's the, it's the idea that um, we've got lots of different camera views, uh, but they're, they're and or sorry, we've got we've got one camera view. Sorry, but it's looking at several different points, and we're going to try and bunch them all together, all of those unknowns, and try and solve for that. Uh, so that's that's the idea here. So this is all the one camera. This is all camera one now at this stage. So we can solve this by, we just basically make a big matrix uh, like this. And the idea here is that we can just put these things down the diagonal. We still have all of these ones here on the side. They're the ones that, uh, this, is, this is the section here that gets multiplied by the scale factor. So the translation gets multiplied by the scale factor every time. But this one here in the first place uh, only gets multiplied by our very first value here. And of course, our sets of zeros here they don't contribute. Now, in the second case, what happens is that one there, it just gets multiplied by this one here. And again, all the zeros don't contribute. But the final part of that over here is that we still have that little section there that gets multiplied by our scale factor. So that's how we set this up as, uh, as a matrix. And we call that the matrix M. And we now have M by... Uh, yeah, we'll do that. M by this lambda here, and that equals zero. And what we're basically saying now is that we want to find this vector. And if we can find that vector, we've got we've not just gone and found, um, if we go back to our diagram, we've not just gone and found one of these, we've found where it's viewed lots of different ones in different places, okay? So the same camera view has gone and viewed lots of different points, they're all different lambdas, but we can figure them all out if we can figure out um, this vector here, okay? Now, what does that vector look like so that we can find each of the individual points? Well, the one thing we know about it is that it lies in the null space of this matrix M, and it should be the only uh, vector in that null space uh, if we've done our, if, we, if, the, if we've got this, uh, this matrix just right. Okay, so if we've got that matrix just right. So once again, we're looking for a vector in the null space, but in truth, there's unlikely to be a perfect null space. And you know the, the, the reason for that is to do with noise, but also the fact that it's gonna be difficult for us to, to judge exactly um, you know, how many points uh, we, we should have in this and so on, okay? So there won't be a perfect null space, but normally what will happen is that one of the eigenvalues will be uh, you know, the smallest. And that will be the closest to what we have as a null space. So what we're going to do, um, as we've done in previous cases, we'll just get M transpose M, and we'll uh, lambda will be a vector asso associated with the smallest eigenvalue of that. So we'll get a, 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 an eigenvector uh, decomposition of that matrix there, and then go and look for the smallest eigenvalue, which remember, if you do your, your, um, your singular value decompositions and so on in software, what will happen is uh, it will order the um, it'll order the the eigenvalues in uh, order size. So the last one will normally be the smallest, and that will be represented by the last uh, the last column uh, of the eigen of the of the eigenvectors there are of, of the singular values, and you can just use that vector then to say that that is the closest thing you have to this this uh, this vector here that you're trying to find. Okay. Now, so if, if it sounds like this is imperfect, it, it is, of course, imperfect because none of our things perfectly worked well up until now. Um, our, our, our essential matrix was never going to be a perfectly essential matrix because of all the noise. And um, there, are, there were lots of other problems that, that, that we were likely to have. Um, so this will be an approximation. And the, how good the approximation is depends on how good your points are. 
okay as to how close you're going to get but it's certainly a very good first start and it's certainly a very good sim uh, you know uh, of the simplest of the mathematical models once we go beyond this we start getting into all sorts of minimization of things rather than simply trying to find a nice neat solution okay so it's a it's a good place for us to start and particularly to understand the problem that's at hand so again uh, when we when we determine that uh, so we determine all those lambdas that are in that matrix, and of course we'll determine we'll, be, we'll determine our um, a value there for a global scale, which we'll divide up through it. But this is still remember that that scale that we put there is still only arbitrary anyway. So um, we still only have this defined defined up to some global scale, where if we multiply it all by five, everything gets gets five times bigger. Okay, so I think you've all been waiting for this this uh, this joke for a while, or you've all been trying to make it for a while. So um, it, it's finally come. Um, so for any of you, uh, if sort of, I don't know if any of our uh, Vin may, may not be familiar with Father Ted. I'm sure the rest of you are. Vin, have you ever come across Father Ted? I don't know how long you're in Ireland. T. Ah, very good. <laughs> you know exactly. <laughs> That's great to hear. Okay. Uh, so for any any anybody watching on YouTube, uh, if you haven't uh, if you haven't seen Father Ted, uh, drop drop whatever you're watching here and just go and watch um, box sets of Father Ted. It's it's much better than whatever I'm delivering here. Um, but anyway, so uh, obviously the, the 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 joke in Father Ted is that uh, poor Father Dougal here on, on the right can't tell the difference between the small miniature cows and and the cows that are out there in the field and are far away. They both look the same to him. So, um, from our point of view, though, this is a, this is a very real problem because, of course, we don't we don't have um, you. Know, we're not necessarily dealing with stereo cameras here, and even if we are. Um, well then, you know, if we are, we probably know the distance between the two the two camera views because we can measure that. But in many cases, uh, you know, this translation is something that happens because we move the camera and we don't know how far it's moved, and we may not have enough information for that. So um, what this means is that if the camera views are a known distance apart, then we can calculate the scale of the of the objects. So that's great if we if we if we know that. And in the autonomous vehicle setting we may well be able to use other sensors, such as GPS is going to get us close, um, or you know, we may be able to figure it out from inertial sensors, and from the, the speed of the ego vehicle, you know, how fast is it moving and so on. Um, and all of those, none of those will be perfect, but a lot of them together, um, if, if we can put a lot of them, to, a lot of them together, we, we might get a, you know, a, a good sense of what the distance is. Tied to that, most of the objects we're going to be looking at are of a fairly well-known size. So vehicles are kind of, you know, we're, we're, we're not expecting to see a vehicle that's 200 foot long, for example. Uh, you know, we're expecting it to be within a certain range, but obviously there's, there's a bit of difference between the different car sizes and the heights and so on. But with all that information, we, we, we'll have a fairly good idea. But the point is that from these algorithms alone, you can't get that information. So um, if we don't know uh, if they're not, um, if they're not, then then we cannot tell if if they are, for example, like five centimeters apart, and we're looking at miniatures, or if they're one meter apart and we're looking at objects twenty times as large. Okay, so we, in many cases, and th there's entire, uh, you know, before before CGI came along, um, and even even since uh, since CGI and augmented reality and so on. Um, there's whole, you know, the whole film industry is, is based on that to a large extent that, uh, you know, all of the science fiction movies and so on would have used miniatures uh, in order to give you cityscapes and so on. And that worked perfectly well because you only have the single camera view and uh, it could give you that impression very well. So this is a well-known problem and you have to find all sorts of ways around it in order to try and solve it, but you can't solve it directly with these algorithms. Okay, so let's take stock of where we are because uh, I know that as each new part comes along, it's very difficult to separate out that from, from, from what else we were doing. So um, if we get eight good correspondences, we can determine the rotation of the camera. So firstly, eight good correspondences. What are eight good correspondences? We've got two, we've got two images and we're looking for eight points that appear in both images that we reckon we can say that that point re uh, is related to that point over there in the two images. Now, you've been working for quite a while on that, um, on the on the assignment that you've been doing uh, on your know, Harris corners and so on, which are fairly good at finding distinctive uh, features within images. 
Um, how good are they at finding that distinctive feature when it appears in another image? Well, if it's distinctive, that should be pretty good. But there are all sorts of problems associated with that if there's a big gap between the two trying to find that because you don't have um, you don't have a very good description of that. All you have is maybe your eigenvalue information and that's about it. Okay, so have you got echo correspondences? That's a matter for another algorithm trying to get those, and we'll we'll look more into those as the as the the course goes on. I wanted to get a full cycle through so that we got to this point, and then we can start looking at improvements at each uh, part along the way. So we'll look at SIFT and so uh, SIFT, um, and probably HOG, uh, histogram of orient gradients, to give maybe some other ideas of uh, of systems whereby we can give good descriptions of the things that we have. Um, and that would always improve the situation. But let's assume that we've got eight good correspondences. Um, then we can determine the rotation of the camera. We can kind of determine the translation uh, in that the 3D points will be related to T by some multiple. Okay, But all we know is that they're related by some multiple and they're all related to each other. But we don't necessarily know that multiple unless we have some information from outside of this algorithm to tell us the, the distance between the cameras. From there, we can determine the 3D points themselves, as we just did in the last few slides. So we can do this with, uh, with more than just the eight points. So if we've got lots of other point correspondences as well, and we only used eight of them in order to solve our eight-point algorithm, well, we can take our other uh, point correspondences as well, um, and you do have to, you know, you, you, you do have to have them as, as point, point correspondences, but you can do that and then you can go and try and find out your, your 3D uh, points for all those. So let's say you have 20 of them or 30 of them, okay? And you go and you find, through these mechanisms, you go and you find where those points are in a 3D space, okay? Um, so we can do this with any points we have correspondences for, but obviously the reconstruction will only be as good as the quality of the correspondences. So the problem then is, let's say you had eight good correspondences, but your correspondences after that were not so good can you still from there try and um, try 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 and uh, you know get something from them? Because as your point correspondences deteriorate in terms of their quality, um, then your points become less less sure that you pick up in the three D world. So what should our concerns be um, with regard? Because I said about good point correspondences. So what if the correspondences are not good? Okay, what happens in that situation? So there's two things here. Firstly, this can lead to degenerate configurations, which we'll talk about next. That's the next section I want to discuss with you tonight, is degenerate co configurations. In other words, configurations of points uh, in our images that will, uh, that will fool us and send us down the wrong track. Um, second of our concerns, if the point correspondences are not good, is that the points may not, uh, may not be degenerate, but have all sorts of noise and errors, which means we'll get... 3D points, they just won't be correct. And how far they're incorrect by, well, that may be an unknown, and that's even worse. It's fine if we know how incorrect we are. Um, well, it's not fine, but it's better, you know? Um, if we if we know that we're gonna be within some tolerance, then we, we can take that into account. But if we don't know how wrong we're gonna be, that's a much greater problem. So we assumed earlier that we knew the camera intrinsic parameters as well. Uh, what if we don't know them? Okay, so in the, in the, that was in the last lecture. We decided that our, our camera matrix, our intrinsic matrix, was just going to be the identity matrix, which couldn't be simpler. Okay, what if we, if, um, what if we don't know the camera intrinsic matrix? How do, how do we deal with that situation? What's going to happen there? So we don't know anything about the camera. In most cases in the automotive sector, you will know the intrinsic parameters as you will have calibrated it as a separate step. So it's a separate step entirely to go and calibrate your camera and find out its intrinsic parameters. And you normally do that with a setup. Um, and that's, that's something I'm considering as uh, the possibility for the, the group project actually is that you go away and do that because uh, it's not something I was going covering here, but I think it's something you should know. Uh, so that's the most likely route I'm going to go down with for, for that um, and more on that la uh, later. Um, but in the case where uh, you know nothing of the cameras, there is an extension to the essential matrix and it's called the fundamental matrix. Um, then there'll be more on that later, there'll even be a song. I won't play the song tonight, but you can go and click on the link and listen to the song. It's, um, I don't know what it, when the Eurovision, uh, it's, it's maybe, but it's, it's probably too good for the Eurovision. Um, but that's called the fundamental matrix. And in many cases, the, um, uh, people, the you know, le uh, lectures or um, textbooks would start with the fundamental matrix and then go on to explain the essential matrix. I've gone the other way about it simply because that's the chronological order in which 
they were kind of discovered or, um, or, or worked out. So there are some of the issues. Um, the other thing is that, um, let's say we've got eight points or 10 points or 20 points or 30 points. Okay, so what can we tell about the world if all you know is that you've got 30 points within the world? Okay, now you've only got 30 points within the world. You can't see the world behind that. You've just got these 30 points. What does that tell you? And it doesn't really tell you a whole lot. See, knowing a few points in the 3D world is not going to paint you a nice picture of the world. Um, even if uh, with 100 points, what do we do? You've got lots of dots, but the dots aren't numbers. So it's not like you know the, the old uh, children's um, uh, plaything where you, you had a, um, a book of these uh, dots and you would join the dots and, and make up a drawing. We have no way of knowing what points are attached to what points and you know how we can draw in between them from this information if all we've got is these points okay so Carl is asking there what what about autofocus so is it, explain to me now what you mean by when you're concerned about autofocus what's the issue there are you you're you're, you're possibly wondering about whether you can use those points to focus your camera to calculate the distance. So there, there are certain, certain method, methods, I won't be going through them here, but there are certain methods in which you can tell depth from defocus. In other words, how something is, de is how much out of focus something is. And um, there are methods for that. Again, they're very separate from the methods that we're going through here. And um, there are other things like trying to do depth from shading. Uh, and there's lots of, lots of other met uh, methods. And um, this is entirely looking at it just from two views. What we're assuming here is that um, our points are all in focus. If they're not in focus, what that is going to do is it's going to cause us some distortion and it's going to, going to cause us to have our 3D points to be out of, out of place. Okay? Um, you will find generally that with, um, with the small cameras that you get uh, in, the, in the automotive setting, you're generally not dealing with large apertures. And for that reason, you're, you're, you tend to be dealing with fairly um, large depth of focus, okay? So in other words, from a short way in front of the camera all the way usually to the horizon is pretty much in focus pretty well, okay? So generally, you wouldn't see them trying to determine things from a, from a point of focus and how much it falls off because that, that can be a bit more difficult, particularly trying to do it um, in a moving vehicle. <coughs> But it is true to say that you, there, there are methods that you can calculate distance from, from focus. Um, and also, it, it would be quite useful to be able to do this sort of thing to try and focus a camera as well um, if, if you knew some point and you want to try and focus on it. Um, but again, that's a, that's a very separate problem from what we're trying to do here. <coughs> okay, so the, the main thing to take from that is that for all of the work we've done here, and as good as it is, um, it really only gets us this point as, we, uh, as far as we've a load of points in the 3D world, but we just have those points and we don't have anything to do with them. Uh, and they don't even have a brightness value. Okay, so we can try and work back to our images and, and determine something about the brightness values from those. And that's what we generally do with dense methods is we try to actually paint the brightness values back onto those, um, onto those uh, different points, bearing in mind that the, the lighting could have changed and all sorts of things in order to try and rebuild up a picture of the world. But the picture will never be perfect. It'll always have big gaps in it um, where it tries to fill in those gaps as best it can. Um, for our purposes, in terms of, um, you know, what we really want to be able to find is we want to be able to find lane markings and we want to, we want to be able to find, you know, traffic lights and so on uh, and obviously other vehicles. And if we can tell that there's there's something there, there's a bunch of points there that make up those sort of things, and and we can t tell something about the um, you know the configuration of them, then we can normally try and work back from that to have some sort of higher level object recognition in order to try and determine uh, maybe what sort of an object it is and so on uh, from from that information. And then where is it positioned is what our concern here is. So there are other methods for doing that as well. Okay, so I mentioned uh, degenerate configuration. So these are You've, uh, you've got your eight points, but maybe there's something wrong with your eight points. Um, so the eight point algorithm is often stated as providing a unique solution up to a scale factor for eight 3D points in general position. And that little in general position, which appears to be just appended onto the end, can often be missed in amongst the other detail. Okay. In general position, now there's strict mathematical uh, meanings for these things, but in general position uh, in our terms means that the points must not lie on certain 2D surfaces often called critical surfaces. So we're looking at a 3D world, 
And if all of our points lie on a 2D surface in that world, um, particular 2D surfaces, um, then we have, uh, we have a problem, okay? So when a configuration does not give us um, a unique solution for a particular class of transformations, we would call this degenerate. Importantly, this refers to the configuration, um, but also to the transforms involved as well. So th the point here is that one transformation's degenerate configuration may be the ideal for another transformation. So in terms of this eight-point algorithm, um, we can have a degenerate uh, configuration that is very useful in other situations, okay? So um, many of the degenerate configurations for the eight-point algorithm refer to surfaces that are described as quadratic, uh, qu uh, sorry, uh, are described by quadratic equations, sorry, uh, sorry, sometimes referred to as quadric surfaces. Most of them don't really show up in the real world. They tend to be these kind of um, pathological uh, uh, examples um, that are, are unlikely to happen in a real world setting. But one that definitely does is the situation that the eight points lie on a 2D plane in the 3D world. Okay. Now, uh, a 2D plane within a 3D world is actually rare enough until you actually come into the, the what we call the, the human made world. Okay, so we have buildings with straight lines and uh, straight walls. And of course, we have paved roads um, that are to a first approximation flat and uh, a 2D surface. Now, there'll always be a certain amount of, um, of, of variance within that, probably more on roads than on, on walls and so on. Um, but you, you have all sorts of problems. And then, of course, you've got other, other vehicles that can have flat sides as well. Um, and so if you pick up eight points that are all on one of those, on one of those surfaces, your eight point algorithm is not going to solve the problem. And that's because it can't fill out the entire space. It hasn't got enough uh, points to actually show you the entire 3D space in front of you. It's only got a, a subspace within that, okay? So for example, if all um, the eight points are on the wall of a building for um, of a building or something else, for both views, then the eight point algorithm will fail. Lane markings uh, for a parking place all lie on a plane or at least a, a, an approximation to a plane. So you can see there that if we ha if we were trying to figure out something about our configuration and we were looking at a you know a parking place and all of our points happen to be on that because maybe that's the most detailed thing there might be there might be markings on it that make it easy for us to have distinctive points there and everything else mightn't be distinctive then in that situation you could be in trouble. So shortly we will see that if we know that all um, uh, sorry that should say points rather than lines if all the points fall on a plane then we can turn this degenerate configuration into an advantage and get away with a four-point algorithm. Okay, so that should, now the thing is, uh, I was probably thinking of something else at the time, but uh, points and lines to some extent um, are, are jewels of each other anyway, so, uh, but it's points I meant to say there. So if we know that all the points lie on a plane, then we can use the, the four-point algorithm. And in actual fact, when it comes to calibration of cameras, we would often use a plane with a checkerboard pattern in order to try and calibrate the camera. So therefore, we would know in that situation what we were looking at. Some of the other degenerate um, cases you can have is that no translation has taken place. So this is where the, um, the camera has, has had a rotation and it could rotate in any of the axes or all three of them but it hasn't actually moved. The camera center is still in the same spot. Again, this is quite rare unless you've got the camera sitting on a tripod and not moving. Um, of course, in a vehicle, if you take several images, but the vehicle hasn't moved, you're gonna have the same problem as well, but you're basically just gonna get the same image in all of those cases, it's not even gonna rotate. Um, it's unlikely you would get on a vehicle situ uh, a situation where you get a rotation, but not a translation that would be quite difficult. I can't think of a way that you would actually do it. Okay. So this is a rare enough situation, but it can happen. So if you've no translation, uh, either the camera hasn't moved or has undergone a pure rotation. Either way, recovering uh, recovery of 3D geometry is not possible in this configuration. So the images might be nice for generating a panorama though. So uh, there are actually systems that are set up um, with special tripods to try and ensure that the particular uh, center of the camera stays in exactly the one spot. Um, and the center may actually be the, 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 the kind of the pinhole or the, the, uh, the aperture of the camera. Um, so it's, it can be a bit more difficult to get that to stay in exactly the one spot. Um, but so there are, are tripods specially for that for doing panoramic images. But for our purposes in trying to calculate 3D points, um, that's it's a degenerate configuration. So as I say, many of these degenerate configurations are perfect for other scenarios, just not in this case. 
So planar homographies, which of course uh, the, the, the word there is plane, okay, so we're, we're, we're talking about planes here. Unlike the previous case where we want eight points in general position, here we want four points. These should also be in general position, by the way, but in, 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 a, in a different situation. And they must lie on a plane in the 3D world. Okay. Now, I think if I remember correctly, for, for this case, they can't all be lying in a line. So you can see how, how, it, all, how it all comes down the way there. If they're all lying in a line, then you, you can't fill out that full space either. Okay. So there can be degenerate cases for these as well. You can't just take four points all on a, on a single line. Um, one of the ways to describe a plane is with a normal vector, so a, a vector that's uh, normal to it, and we've discussed this a number of times, so here again we see the same sort of maths coming up again and again. This is a vector that is normal to the plane, i.e. at 90 degrees to the plane. Once again, we are using the idea of a null space. So the normal is in the null space of the plane, it's the only vector that um, when it, um, that uh, if you, uh, um, if, if you um, project it onto the plane, it, it, it projects to zero. Any other one, if it's not normal to it, if it's at some other angle, it will project onto the plane or part of it will, okay? Um, so we're trying, so that's in the null space of the plane. So if it's a 2D plane in a 3D world, it'll have a one dimensional null space and that is the normal vector. So in a 3D world, a single vector, this uh, a single vector makes up just one dimension. The normal vector only meets the plane at the origin in the 3D coordinates. So therefore, any 3D vector that is in the null space of the, of the normal vector space is in the plane. So that's, we're saying the opposite now. What we're saying is if we just have our, our normal vector and we say, okay, what's in the null space of that normal vector? Now, the normal vector is a one-dimensional vector in a three-dimensional space. So therefore, it must have a two-dimensional null space. And that two-dimensional null space is de is the definition of the of the plane that's there. Okay, so therefore any three D vector uh, that is in the null space of the normal vector space is in the plane. So if you try and project it onto that normal vector and it comes out as zero, it must be in the plane somewhere. You can think of this as describing the plane as everything that the normal vector is not. So i.e. vectors that have absolutely nothing in common with the normal vector are in the plane. By in common here, we mean that if it's projected onto the normal vector, it will result in some non-zero amount. But vectors in the plane, when projected onto the normal vector, result in zero. Now, if we have a situation where the plane is not passing through the origin, uh, then we have a slightly different situation. So previously, we assumed that the plane passes through the origin, and that's what gives us the zero when we do these projections. And remember, to have a subspace, a two-dimensional subspace, it has to pass through the origin. But what if we have a plane that isn't passing through the origin? What's the situation there? So um, this is a little restrictive as we want to discuss planes that do not pass through the origin uh, because the origin is usually at the camera and the plane won't necessarily pass through that, uh, that camera. So this is relatively straightforward. We simply move the plane along, uh, along the normal vector to some distance d. So I've, I've, um, I've drawn this here. We can see we're at the origin here in our black line um, and this is our plane. Uh, but that would clearly be inside of the camera. So what I want to do is I want to move it a distance um, a distance D out to here. And now what will happen, and I'll just write that as a D. What will happen is if we project anything on the plane uh, onto the normal vector, it will now result in the value D rather than in the value 0. Okay. So um, just to, uh, as, as we have it there, it'll result in the scalar value D rather than zero. So we can place the origin at one of the camera centers, which is useful for, uh, for doing that. So we can place the origin there. So what this means is that previously what we would have had is we would have had um, this formula here, N transpose, this is the normal vector transpose so that we can uh, multiply it by our 3D vector X1. And that would have given us zero if the, um, if the normal vector and the plane were passing through, uh, or, and that vector that was on the plane were passing through um, the origin. But it's not. So when, now when we project uh, this 3D point, which is in the plane, and we project it onto the normal vector, we get a value of D instead. Okay, so we can work with that in order to, to calculate our equations as well. So basically what we can do is now, we can divide both of these sides by D, uh, giving me, um, giving me 1 over d on this side and just a single 1 on this side, okay? So this is with respect to camera 1. Obviously, we'll have a camera 2. So in terms of camera 2 center, this would be the following. What we do is we take the, um, 
the coordinate of our point in terms of camera one, we rotate it, we translate it, and we end up with the same core, same point, but now it's in the coordinates of the second camera. That's why it's called X2. There is now a clever trick that we can do here, which is that we can say that T there is the same as one by T. Okay, so one times T is the same as T. That's fair enough. The reason this is useful is that we have a formula up here, which is equal to one. So what we can do is we can literally just take that and we can su uh, substitute it in into there in place of the, the 1 times t. And this, um, for some reason during my lectures, uh, the uh, my podcasting always tries to tell me about uh, what uh, what new podcasts are available. So uh, I get to get that. Um, sorry, uh, Vin, you're asking me why, why rotate? You're asking me why is this rotation here? Is that what you're asking me? Yeah, so um, remember though, what we have here is we've got a plane somewhere, right? And we've got points on that plane. Now, I'm only showing a, 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 a rotation of it, right? So in one camera view, we're seeing, we're seeing that point there. Okay, so we'll just draw it up to that point. We're seeing that point there. And then in a second camera view, which is both a rotation and a translation, uh, what we do is... Um, we get our second camera here, and it's, that didn't uh, draw straight for me for some reason. Second camera there, and it's viewing that there. And that is both a rotation and a translation that will take place there. So just the same as in the previous case uh, with the eight points, we have to rotate. We can rotate and translate within that, okay? So what we now have is a, uh, a, a wider ranging formula, which is we have the same coordinates. So this is this is our coordinate, whatever it is, okay? And it's um, this is it its coordinate in this is in terms of camera two. This is in terms of camera one. So we rotate it in terms of camera uh, to, to in terms of uh, to get it to camera two. We rotate it. We translate it, and of course we also know that it's on a plane. Okay, so we know that this X1 is on a plane and we've managed to put that information into the system, encoded into the system that is that is in there. If we don't, we're back at the same place we were previously. Okay, so we, we need to try and encode that information about the plane, so the normal and how far we're out on that um, with relation to it. Okay. So... Uh, just going back to, Vin is asking, do you have to translate when you rotate? So no, you can rotate, you can rotate without translation, okay? But the point is that if we don't have a, a translation, if there isn't, so we've we've done a rotation there. Um, so we could record our translation as the gap between there and there, and then whatever rotation has taken place. If we have no rotation, that's probably fine. But if we've no translation, we will not be able to figure out uh, our 3D geometry because we saw that that was a degenerate case previously. Now, in most cases, you will get a bit of both and therefore you're going to have to assume that there is a bit of both and you're going to have to do it. So it could be that this rotation is actually a zero rotation. That's fine. If this translation is a zero translation, that's not fine. We're in trouble. Uh, we won't be able to figure out anything about our 3D geometry. So you can very much think of this as if I have just one eye here, I can rotate it all I want, makes no difference. But if I have only one eye, I can't tell anything about depth uh, because I don't have a gap between the two. So if there's no translation going on there, we have a problem, okay? But in any case, we assume that both has taken place. So um, what we do is, uh, and by the way, you, you, you may have noticed there when I, um, when I multiplied in this bit, uh, I multiplied it in a particular position. So I actually multiplied it on that side of the T rather than on this side of the T, okay? And the reason for that is that you just need to be a little bit careful when it comes to your linear algebra um, to consider the shapes of the vectors and the matrices that you're dealing with to know which side you can multiply to get the right behavior. Because you can multiply by one on either side. It doesn't really matter. Um, but in terms of the linear algebra, it will very much matter if it doesn't work. So we, we now see that X1 is common, so we can take it out as a common factor. Okay, so all I'm saying here is that we've got x1 in both of these places here and here. So let's take that out as a common factor and we have it there. Okay, so now we have in here in, in this, we have a rotation, we have the translation, and we have 
the information about our um, our plane that we've included in it. Because remember, this is a special case where everything, where all the points are, are, are lying on a plane. So we want to be able to encode that into it. So when we do that, we have what's called a homography matrix. We call that H and it's, it's basically uh, governed by this information here. Uh, so it's made up of rotations, translations, and the information about the plane. And this, um, this is equivalent, uh, just be careful, so because the way it looks, this is equal to this over here. So we've, we've put the, I've just uh, defined it there as that. So that basically means that we have this situation here where I have a relationship between the, um, the, the point on the plane and the uh, and it's a position in both the uh, the cameras, okay? So it's it's views uh, or sorry, it's it's in in both the co uh, camera coordinate frames, and that's governed by the homography matrix. Okay, so if we you can kind of think of the two different camera frames as two different origins, two different coordinate frames, and the relationship between them. In other words, all the rotations and translations and something to do with the plane that's involved. That's all um, encoded in this one matrix here, this H matrix. Okay. So H is a 3x3 three three matrix called a homography matrix and it relates the 3D points that lie on a 2D plane to each other in terms of the two camera centers, i.e. the same point in two different coordinate frames. Do be aware this only works for when they're on a plane. So this is not the same as the situation we saw previously, even though it looks very similar to what we had with the essential matrix. You're going to see some small differences creeping in now uh, because of the fact that H and E are not the same sort of thing. So, of course, we we um, we don't usually know the 3D coordinates. So um, so having this this here is not particularly useful. And why is it not useful? Well, we don't know X1 and X2 there. We don't know the 3D coordinates and we don't know the homography matrix. So if we don't know any of this, it's all fine while having a relationship between the things we don't know and we can't work it out. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and vouch this in things that we do know. We do know uh, the corresponding points because we think we figure them out uh, using Harris corners or SIFT or something else. We think we've figured out uh, point correspondences between two images. So we have the point in our two uh, uh, images, which we've called uh, small x1 and small x2. What's their relationship to their 3D coordinate? Well, we have lambda 1 and lambda 2. In other words, the distance from the camera out to that point, because it's projected along that, along that, that vector. So if we have all that, then we have a relationship between that and the homography matrix. And unfortunately, we don't know the lambda 1 and lambda 2, so we're not there yet. But if you recall from previously, we were able to get rid of um, one side of this or get one, rid of one of the lambdas and then get rid of the second one by multiplying across by something. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and get rid of that x2 there. And we can do that by getting the cross product of it with itself. So we use that skew symmetric matrix uh, x2 cross and we multiply each side by that so basically what I would be doing is I'd be coming along here and saying x2 cross and um, x2 cross on this side as well and what that means is that that when multiplied by that is going to give us a zero the lambda 2 in the middle is uh, just multiplied by zero now in the middle so we've ended up with a complete zero on that side so we've just ended up with zero in here altogether but we've ended up with all of this on the other side um, which is x2 cross h by x1. What's happened by lambda 1? Well, we saw that last time. If we have this x2 cross h lambda 1 and by x1, that lambda 1 is just a scalar value. It's like the value 5 or the value 7. And if that all equals 0, all I have to do is divide both sides by lambda 1. Divide all of this by lambda 1. And that's my job done. That's going to come out as still zero. And I've got rid of this on this side. Now, remember, you always lose something when you do this information, as we said before. So this is why um, we can't always solve the problem as, as, as easy as we might. But nonetheless, uh, we now have a relationship. So this is very similar to um, the, uh, and, this, and it's very similar to the epipolar constraint, except it's called the planar epipolar constraint. And there is a slight difference between it and the previous one. So we're now relating the two points that we have in the images that we reckon are corresponding points, we now have a relationship between them that's given by this H matrix. The difference is though, we have the point here and we have the skew symmetric matrix that's the cross product 
with the second point, which is not exactly the same as we have in the epipolar situation. And it makes things a little bit, uh, a little bit messier in terms of the shape of our, our matrices, but, but nonetheless, we can use fewer points. So there's a subtle difference there in that we're multiplying by x2 cross rather than x2 itself. So um, we said that the uh, the H homography matrix is a three by three matrix. So what we can do is we can do that similar stacking uh, operator that we did previously, stack it all into one vector. And as you can imagine, what are we gonna try and do? We're gonna try and find this vector by finding it in the null space of something else. Okay, and it's gonna be in the null space of all those points uh, when we put them as a matrix. So the X2 cross is a three by three skew symmetric matrix. So A this time uh, that we're going to do is, is basically going to be this is the Kronecker product of X1 with this X2 matrix. And what that's going to do is it's actually going to make us a 9 by 3 matrix. In other words, that uh, the X2 matrix, which is a 3 by 3 matrix, um, which let's just imagine we, we build it here, uh, which is kind of 0, 0, 0, if you remember here. Um, I do my u u1 minus u2 and u3, and then on that set of minus u3, um, u2 and u1. Okay, um, and what we do then is we multiply that by x, uh, the Kronecker product with x1. Uh, so x1 is let's say uh, we'll just call it v1, v2, and v3. And what happened is that we, we multiply V1 by that and we'll, we'll get V1 times that in the first case. So V gets multiplied by each of those values. Then we, we basically make a second one of these below it. Okay. So we make a copy of these. They won't be the exact same numbers because these ones will be multiplied by V2 and then we make another set of them tonight. So... Um, just to remember that, that what we're going to end up with is we're going to do a Kronecker product uh, between X1 and X2 cross here. Uh, X2 cross is a 3 by 3 skew symmetric matrix, which I've, I've mostly kind of drawn out there. Uh, it's not very well written, but it's, it's, it's got it mostly there. And we do a Kronecker product with, um, the, the, ma or the, with the, the vector X1. That will have three parts to it. The first part gets multiplied by each of the values in here. Okay. And then we make a second copy of this down here and we multiply all of those by V2 so that they're all multiplied up. And then we make a second, a third copy of it and we multiply all those values by, by V3, the third, uh, the third coordinate of our X1. And what that's going to do then is it's going to give us a, um, a nine by three matrix. So that when I multiply this by the H, which is a, a nine by one matrix, as we see there, I'm going to end up with a three by nine uh, by a nine by one. So nine by one. And that gives me, that lend me up with just a, a three by one vector there, uh, which is like that. It'll be all zeros because it should be equal to zero. So that's the idea there. Okay. This does not want to change page. So, uh, once again, we won't have enough information to just find that on its own. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to get enough enough points and four will be enough in this case. So if n is equal to four or bigger, um, then we have enough point pairs. And what we can do is we can then build that up. So um, our n in this case is going to be, let's say, a value of four or more. So we'll say bigger than or equal to four. So if that was the case, then we would have a three, three n by nine. So which would be a, a 12 by nine matrix, for example, um, which we would then multiply by uh, this, this one here, which is again a nine by one. And that should end us up with a, um, a zero, zero, zero there again. Well, it'll be, it'll be 12 by one. So it'll be, it'll be a pile of zeros, but nonetheless, they should all be zeros is what we're getting at here. It should be in the in the null space of that, okay? Um, and what we're trying to find out is we're trying to find out what vector there, um, what vector there H of S, so this one back here, what vector of that brings us to that, that, uh, that zero position, okay? Uh, so that's we want to find the null space basically of this, of this large matrix here, the, 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 the 3n by 9 matrix. So this is called the, the four-point algorithm. So just like uh, with the essential matrix, the homography matrix can be estimated up to a scale factor. 
So the concise algorithm is written as follows. You compute the matrix A for the four points. And of course, you can, you can do more points than that as well if you want, but um, four points at least will be required. Um, compute a solution to the HS, that S should be down the bottom, it doesn't matter, um, for equation 18 using the singular value decomposition and uh, taking the column vector with the smallest singular value. And we saw that with the essential matrix. We did it by the exact same method. So it's the same method again uh, for how we find a null space. Then what we do is we extract the motion parameters from the homography matrix. So we have this, um, this homography matrix and we want to break it up into the R and the, the T and we need to find out what the, the plane is as well. So H can be decomposed into um, R, N and this T over D. Again, we just have a, we have a scale factor there that's related and this time it's, it's related to the, the distance to the plane. Um, there's a number of different ways of decomposing that, so I don't kind of show them here. Uh, there's a link to um, a full book, which I think is about 100 pages. It's not all on, it's all on planar homographies, but it's not all on uh, on the decompositions. But you will see there's just quite a number of different ways of get, trying to get the best decomposition from that. None of them perfect, okay? Um, and I'm sure as you've, as you've noticed um, from doing the assignment that you're doing, you know, what appears easy in a lecture in just a few slides, or not easy, but uh, understandable in a lecture, when you go and you look into it in much more detail, you find that you, you can go down rabbit holes and it gets to, there's much more depth and there's much more uncertainty related to it. So the same here, you could you could give one of the decompositions or, or a way of doing it, but no, none of them are perfect. So once again, we can see that we can reconstruct the translation um, up to a scale, uh, which is related to the, uh, the, the, the D. So in this case, it is scaled by the distance to the plane and we can compute the 3D coordinates um, as we did for the eight-point algorithm, okay? So guys, we've only, as I say, we've only six uh, slides to go and it's, it's handy enough from here. So I think we'll just keep going rather than take a break um, and we'll, we'll finish early. So um, this is the last part that we want to look at, which is uh, the situation that we have if we don't know the camera matrix. And if you remember in the last set of slides, we assumed that we knew the camera matrix and that it was the identity matrix. And that was that seemed pretty easy. So the essential matrix worked on the principle that we know the camera intrinsic parameters and further that we assume no skew and we can give everything in units of focal length leading to the canonical camera matrix K equals to the identity, where or the I, where I is the three by three identity matrix. But of course, cameras aren't like that. They have all sorts of things that we, we may not know about them. So we might not know anything about the cameras. We might know its focal length. We might know anything about um, the, uh, the, the shape or the ratios of the pixels uh, or the scales of them. And... Um, and we might know anything about any distortions either, uh, you know, that might be in the lens. So it's reasonable to think of this as not so much knowing the camera matrix as um, pretending it doesn't exist, okay, which is what we did in the, in, in the case last week. However, the camera matrix, if it is not the identity, will have an effect on the projection of the 3D coordinates and a very important effect. So we do need to consider it. So if we, if we know K, but it's not the identity matrix, so we know our different parameters there, our focal lengths, our skews, um, uh, or sorry, our scales, uh, maybe any skew factor that might be there, and we know the, the uh, uh, shift from the origin of the center of the camera, um, then what we can do is we can, we can well, we can do the following. If, we, if we've separately cal cal uh, calculated the calibration matrix and we know this information for the camera, uh, and therefore we know K, um, all we need to do is transform our pixel coordinates that we have. So we've, we've got an image. We transform our pixel coordinates back to what they would be if we didn't have that particular camera matrix. In other words, back to the identity. And we do that by getting the inverse um, uh, of the coordinate with our camera matrix. In other words, we, we've, we've, we've already projected it through the camera matrix. We now want to project it back through it so that we now end up with a position where we're ready to deal with the essential matrix. So we can do this. Um, uh, we'll, um, we can do this with all points. Let's just say with uh, with all point correspondences, and then we are at our starting point for either the four point or the eight point algorithm. We can do it from there. So this is the most likely scenario in the automotive setting because in the automotive setting, you don't just put cameras on your car that you know nothing about. You put a camera on your car, and if there's any, um, you, you know, if they're going to, there's going to be any variances in the cameras. What you're going to do is you're going to bring it in to a calibration um, position, and you're going to calibrate the camera and try and find out all the pieces of information about it, and you're going to include that then uh, within your model. So that's the most likely scenario. You know, 
uh, when you want to go and figure out your 3D geometry, you already know your uh, camera matrix, okay? But you've calculated some other way. What happens if you've got images, okay? So you've got images, but you know nothing about the cameras that took them. Can you still figure this out from there? So imagine a situation where we have two views, but no information about the camera. This might be the case with archive film, for example. Um, uh, it's also the case where we take two images of a location from, from the internet from two different photographers. Okay, so two examples here. Uh, one is, um, do you remember the, uh, the 1966, uh, well, I'm sure most of you weren't around for the 1966 World Cup. Um, but you remember there was, there was um, I think it was between England and Germany, and there was some question over one of the goals as to whether it went over the line or not. It hit the bar and it bounced down and so on. And there was all these questions going on over the years as to whether it did or it didn't. So as far as I know, they were able to go back and figure a lot of that out using some of these kind of techniques here. Um, Yes, that's that. That's what he said at the end. Indeed, uh, it's, it's it, they think or they think it's all over, but uh, or it is now or something. Uh, so that's that's the match. And I think if I remember um, correctly, I think England were two goals ahead, and that's why. So in other words, when that second goal went in, there was no doubt about it or something. Um, but there was always question over that. And the goal line technology that's now used, I, I don't know much about it, but again, I think that that uses some, some camera systems rather than sensor systems, multiple cameras in order to try and find out 3D geometry to figure that, or at least that's how I go about it, but I, I'm not sure. I think it's called Hawkeye or something like that, but I've never actually looked into to, um, the specific systems that they use. So that's, that's, but they were dealing with archival footage and they were still able to uh, be pretty sure as to which happened. I can't remember which happened, whether it went over or it didn't, uh, but I don't think it matters much now. The other situation that people are able to do is they're able to take, um, you know, iconic uh, structures like, uh, let's say, the, the Arc de Triomphe uh, in Paris or um, the uh cathedral to Not notre dame or some of those you know, some of those those places the tourists visit all the time and take photographs of and they were able to get lots of photographs from the internet all taken by different photographers different lighting different positions people in the photographs and not in the photographs and so on but the one common feature that would be in them is the actual uh 3d structure that was there and from that they were able to actually reconstruct um quite a detailed um uh, analysis of it and I think that that Selesky book if any of you have it the um, there's a bit on the shelf here it's a big it's a big book um, so you can uh, you can't really see that but they actually the image on the side is exactly that it's it's trying to build up I think that's Cathedral in Notre Dame or something like that trying to build that up from uh, so if you can see that image if you go looking on the internet or whatever um that that's actually using that type of an algorithm where they've tried and figured that out from from lots of different views so um so if we two views two cameras but no information uh this is attempting reconstruction from uncalibrated views okay so we don't know any information so let's assume the same camera has taken both views and if it hasn't we can just do a different camera matrix for each one of them we can rework the epipolar constraint as follows. So instead of, uh, of this, which is the epipolar constraint, what we're going to do is we're going to throw in the inverse here of the camera matrix, which we don't know, of course. Um, so the whole idea of that is that we're now priming our um, X1 coordinate to be in the right, uh, the, you know, the 2D coordinate to be in the right frame for dealing with the, the essential matrix. We need to do the same with the second camera, but of course, uh, we want to be able to have the, our camera matrix on this side instead of on the other side, so that we can put it together with these two parts here. So what we do, and this is something you might not have seen before, is we have the minus transpose there. And what that is basically is the transpose of the inverse, okay? Um, if we have separate cameras, we can put those as camera two and camera one if we want. But again, this is just going to make our life even more difficult because now we've got a matrix there and it's going to be difficult to disambiguate those two. So this gives rise to the fundamental matrix, which is this one here, okay, which is, is probably much more famous than the essential matrix. Um, but in actual fact, um, it's uh, you know in, in, in the majority of the cases, we're going to try and avoid using the fundamental matrix if we can. And basically what this means is that it's the essential matrix, but with the, the camera matrix for camera one, uh, the inverse of it, and then the inverse, uh, uh, the transpose of the inverse of camera two. And if they're both the same camera, then it's the same camera matrix. 
uh, and the whole lot of that makes up the fundamental matrix okay so um, as I say uh, a lot of uh, a lot of um, lectures would start with that and work down to the essential matrix but they actually came the other way uh, in terms of chronological order so k is invertible so um, uh, so the k because the k matrix is invertible um, then um, f will have the same rank as e now what that's basically saying is if you remember the essential matrix had a rank of two so what happens when we multiply it by other matrices <coughs> well if k is invertible it means it must be full rank and so is this one it's invertible so it must be full rank so if you multiply um a rank deficient matrix by a full rank matrix you end up with the same rank deficiency as you started with so the so we'll still have that same the same rank of e so f will have the same rank as e is what we're saying here so we can use the exact same method of singular value decomposition of f as we did for e and with that uh, we can end up with our our two um our two uh, singular values there and we should get this one as being zero now you remember we might not get it perfect so we expect that one to be the smallest and we can then set it to zero to give us a, the closest fundamental matrix the same as we did with the essential matrix again not perfect but it might do the job so many texts and courses start with the fundamental matrix and break it down to the camera matrix and essential matrix However, chronologically, the essential matrix uh, came first. So that's the way I've gone about it. And we spent much more time in the essential matrix than the fundamental matrix. But if you went the other way about it, you'd spend much more time in the fundamental matrix and then just mention the essential matrix at the end. Uh, it really depends on which you do first. Um, I went about the other way simply because I think in the majority of cases, we will have a calibrated camera. So either way, the method for solving them is the same. That is the link to the fundamental matrix song. Go and click on it and have a have a watch of it after class. Uh, it's a bit of fun. It's only two or three minutes long. It's clearly some uh, postgraduate students who had some other talents as well. Um, and if you learn it off, it'd probably give you uh, quite a good idea for the essential matrix as, as well of what, what the sequence of steps are. Um, so I know that a lot of computer vision students do actually go and learn off the song um, and you can find the lyrics to it as well. Okay. Um, so note uh, that sigma one and sigma two uh, those ones there if you remember when we did the essential matrix what we did was we we added those together and divided by two and put this put them to the same value uh, for the essential matrix but that's not the case with f sigma one and sigma two are not necessarily the same size as in the essential matrix um, so getting f may be similar to getting e but from there things get a lot harder the decomposition is not so easy um, I, we cannot easily separate the intrinsic and extrinsic parameters and if you can see there if you had two different camera matrices in there separating those out and making sure you had the right one in the right place again very very difficult so we can determine reconstructions not up to scale this time but up to a projective reconstruction so in other words um we, we mightn't even have it in the in the in the the, the 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 correct manner in other words that it can still change in its projection okay um so it might be in a, in a slightly slightly different shape. So the takeaway from that is try to find the camera intrinsic param, uh, parameters separately because it'll make life an awful lot easier. And that's um, one of the reasons why, even though this can be figured out, you don't see um, uh, you don't see autonomous vehicles and uh, ADAS systems and so on with the cameras uncalibrated because if you can calibrate it, you make life not just easier on yourself but much more much more certain. Uh, rather than going out and just going, well, I'm going to figure it out from the images that I see, which would not be the right way to go about it. Okay, so that's it for tonight, guys. Uh, thanks for your attention. And uh, we've gone an hour and 10 minutes, so uh, well done on that. No problem, guys. Okay, so say goodnight to you there.